This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Tips for filling out a winning NCAA tournament bracket next on this week's edition of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it, Tim Clark. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it, get it, touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure from second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. I'm Steve Dace, and welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. I'm wearing the new official Big Ten champion basketball shirt, courtesy of the MDEN. And that can only mean March Madness is here. And in the entire episode this week will be devoted to Michigan's pursuit for a third Final Four in the last eight years. Michigan, a number one seed. It's the first time ever that a player and a coach has been a number one seed in one career. Juwan Howard is the first person to ever pull that off, and I think I explained that as convoluted as I possibly could. But you knew what I was trying to say. Now, over the last few years, I've learned a thing or two about filling out an NCAA tournament bracket. Number one, if you want to win, don't do it based on what you actually think, but based on what the data, the trends, and the math actually says. So we're going to start off this episode later in later on. I'll talk about why I don't believe Michigan will make the final four this year, but I want to start off by doing something positive, giving all of you a bit of a, uh, an advantage in your office pool, because what I'm about to share with you has helped me finish in the top 1% at ESPN.com's bracket contest, the last three consecutive NCAA tournaments. In fact, I've correctly predicted six of the eight teams that went on to play for the national championship. So here's a few big picture things you need to know first, because the goal is to pick the champion. That's typically how you win. 17 of the last 18 national champions entered the postseason in the top 40 of Ken Pomeroy's offense and defense rankings. That's these 16 teams from the bottom up, Florida, Texas, Yukon, Texas Tech, BYU, Arkansas, Colorado, USC, Purdue, Virginia, Wisconsin, Houston, Illinois, Michigan, Baylor, Gonzaga. You, that means your national champion is on that list unless somebody just goes Shabazz Napier, which happens about once every 20 years. Short of that, your national champion is on this list. Now, when you look at these teams and we start getting into the big picture, something to keep in mind is COVID, and then 
Isaiah Livers with Michigan. Michigan's profile will check every box, as you will see, for teams to win the national championship, but that profile was built with Isaiah Livers. And then you have teams like Baylor, for example, that went on a COVID pause and beforehand, everything on their platform checked every box for winning the national championship as well. So account for these kinds of mitigating factors, especially COVID, when filling out your bracket. Also account for coaching experience. Look at this stat. In the last 30 years, only five coaches have won the NCAA tournament on their first trip to the Final Four. That is something it is very difficult to do, is to handle the expectations and everything that goes along with it if you've never been there before. All right, with those big picture items out of the way, let's look at some recent trend lines. 16 of the last 20 teams to make the Final Four, so 80%, that's a pretty good trend, ranked in the top 20 of Ken Pomeroy's defensive ratings. And a 17th team, North Carolina in 2017, finished 21st. So you're probably not getting to the Final Four unless you're really good on defense. This year, that applies to these teams in order of their defensive ranking. Loyola of Chicago, Alabama, Tennessee, Illinois, Kansas, Michigan, Utah State, Gonzaga, San Diego State, VCU, Wisconsin, Arkansas, North Carolina, Houston, St. Bonaventure, Rutgers, USC, and Clemson. If this trend holds... At least three of your four Final Four teams are on that list that we just had up on the screen right there. All right, next trend to keep in mind. In the last five years, all 10 national championship game participants have ranked in the top six of overall efficiency metrics since February 1st. Since February 1st. This year, that's these teams. Since February 1st, these have been the six best teams in America in order. Gonzaga, Illinois, Houston, Iowa, BYU, and Michigan. Iowa has really improved its defensive metrics since February 1st. Keep that in mind for when Iowa comes up again later on. That's why you can't just go blindly with the numbers. you got to know the context of those numbers as well. But if the trend line holds, your national championship participants were on the list that we just showed you. Another trend to know. Teams that rank in the top 25 in two-point defense – And outside the top 50 in three-point rate, or the amount of three-pointers they take, traditionally do well in the tournament. All right, So if you can stop teams from getting easy baskets and you don't rely on a lot of 20-plus foot jump shots to win, that's a pretty good formula. All right, That applies to these teams in order of their two-point defense. USC, Michigan, Utah State, Florida State, North Texas, Texas Tech, Grand Canyon, St. Bonaventure, and Illinois. Those are teams that can stop you from getting to the rim and scoring easy baskets, but don't rely on a bunch of 20-point jump shots and the randomness of of three-pointers on any given night in order to beat you. Now, what you're going to see, though, when, when you look at that list, is a couple of those teams play each other in the first round. Teams like Utah State and Texas Tech, for example. All right, here's another one. Since Ken Palm began in 2002... So that's, uh, that's 20 years of data, almost. Less than 1% of the teams to enter the tournament, top 10 in either defense or offense, but outside the top 50 in the other, meaning they're kind of helter-skelter, they're elite at one thing and not good at the other. Only 1% of those teams have gone on to make the Final Four, which means you don't want to pick these teams for the Final Four in your bracket. In seed order, that applies to these teams. Ohio State. Kansas, Villanova, Tennessee, LSU, and Utah State. All right, that's a 1% trend going back 20 years, which means you don't want to put any of the teams I just mentioned in your Final Four if you're playing the odds. Now, a couple of interesting teams is Loyola of Chicago, 49th in offense. They're close, they're top 10 in defense. But then you see Iowa there, 50th in defense, which means they'd be right on the line of a team that typically loses early, but Keep in mind, since February 1st, Iowa has changed its defensive identity. So I don't think you can apply this stat to the Hawkeyes because you look at their overall efficiency metrics the last two months, and they've been one of the top six teams in the country. So I don't think you can count them. But those other teams I mentioned, I definitely would not pick any of them to make the Final Four. Now, let's go round by round. When you're picking in what they call the round of 64, we used to call it the first round, but now they have the play-in games. I'm sorry, the first four. When you're picking in the round of 64, 
advance every number one seed, all time 16 seeds are just one and 140. All time number 15 seeds are just eight wins and 140 losses. So pick every one and two seed to move on. Pick at least one 13 or 14 seed to win. At least one of them wins about 20% of the time, which is about once per tournament. 12 seeds have won at least one game against five seeds in 27 of the last 31 years. In fact, in our last tournament in 2019, three 12 seeds beat five seeds. And all time, nine seeds are almost exactly 500 against eight seeds. When we move on to the round of 32, or what we used to call the second round, pick all the number one seeds to advance to the Sweet 16. All time, number one seeds make it past the first weekend at an almost 90% clip. It's not worth the odds trying to guess which one seed may lose this year when you're looking at a trend line going back to 1979. Pick at least one double-digit seed to the Sweet 16. At least one has made it that far in 33 of the last 34 or 35 years. Staying with the round of 32, pick at least one upset of a number two or number three seed. Only twice in the last 35 years have all of them made it out of the first weekend, although it should be noted that the last tournament, 2019, happened to be one of them. Do not pick any seed lower than a 12 to make it out of the first weekend. Only 1.4% of teams lower than 12th since seeding began in 1979 have made it that far. So that, that is a trend line you do not want to try to roll snake eyes picking against. Now on the Sweet 16, advance at least exactly three number one seeds to that round all time. Number one seeds make it to the Elite Eight about 75% of the time. Advance no team seeded worse than 11th all time. Only elite, only one Elite Eight team out of 288 has been seeded 11th. Now, when we get to the Elite Eight, advance exactly one or two number one seeds to the Final Four. 28 of the last 35 Final Fours had exactly one or two number one seeds. Advance no double-digit seeds to the Final Four. Since seeding began in 1979, only five out of 164 Final Four teams, that's 3%, have been seeded lower than ninth. That's a 97% trend going back to 1979. You don't even want to try to, uh, to figure that one out. When we get to Indianapolis and the Final Four, advance no team seeded lower than sixth to the championship game. Only two championship games in the last 34 years have had any team seeded worse than sixth. Since seeding began in 1979, number one seeds have squared off for the national championship only eight times in 41 years. That's just 19%. That is, however, keep this in mind though. Five of those eight meetings have occurred in the last 15 years, which means the seeding is getting better. The seeding is getting tighter, meaning the tournament is getting chalkier. Five of the last... 15 years, the championship game has been between two number one seeds. When we get to the championship game, 30 of the last 31 teams to win the national title were seeded fourth or better. Now you're going to probably want to run through these again before you fill in your bracket. Watch it again. Pause. Make sure. Follow the trend. The trend is your friend unless there's mitigating factors like Michigan, for example, with a key injury to Isaiah Livers. And that is something we'll be talking about here in a moment. Hey, Steve Dace here. And we get asked all the time here at Michigan Podcast, what can we do to help support you guys? Well, one of the things you could do to help support us, which may also support you, is to join our exclusive club at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. $5 a month. You get exclusive podcasts, instant reaction ones after Michigan football games. All year long, you get access to our handicapping tips. If you have been following us, for example, this college basketball season, then you're 48 games over 500 documented with all the plays that we have posted all season long here on our Patreon page at Michigan Podcast. Over the weekend, you like this quite a bit because we posted a parlay, a 14 parlay that paid off at about plus 250 odds. 
So a good amount of money there. We gave you a couple of conference tournament future bets that paid off as well. Texas paid off as well as uh, Illinois to win the Big Ten at plus 375. So you not only just get, you know, uh, charged $5 a month, but you may make some good amount of money by supporting us on Patreon as well. So patreon.com slash Michigan podcast is where you can go. Last year, our baseball picks were dynamite. We'll be starting those back up here as we get into April and May. Want to thank all of you for supporting us at Patreon. And if you're not, hey, it might be costing you money by not supporting us at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. Back here on Michigan podcast. And, and let's now... Uh, get a little bit more local and focus just on the Wolverines. And let me say this right here from the outset. This has been a fantastic basketball season. There's only four ways that you can put up uh, a banner uh, at the end of a, a, a college basketball season. When your regular season, uh, when your conference tournament, get to the final four, win the national championship. And Michigan's already claimed one of those. And I would argue, other than winning the national championship, the second hardest one. Uh, a grueling slog in this league. It's the first time ever one conference has received both two number ones and two number two seeds in the same year. This is a historically great year for the Big Ten Conference. For Michigan to be the undisputed, as it says right here, undisputed champion of this conference is a special season. It's the conference title that eluded Jawan Howard when he played for the Fab Five. So to me... This has already been a memorable year that I'm very, very thankful for as a fan. If that sounds like it's also a bit of a setup for what I'm about to say next, you're right. Because I think there's three reasons, unfortunately, that Michigan won't make the Final Four this year. And the number one reason is pretty obvious. We, we don't have this guy. I, I think replacing his 12 to 13 points, we have the talent to do that. And yes, he's the biggest leader on the team, but it's a team of leaders. I mean, you can see the way the Wolverines came back against Ohio State down the stretch in the Big Ten tournament semifinals when they almost had a chance to win the game. But it just lessens your margin for error. You're talking about a guy that historically is one of the greatest three-point and free-throw shooters in the history of our program. Free-throw shooting to close a team out in a one-and-done scenario. Hitting that big perimeter shot. When you look at the game against Ohio State, you knew Hunter Dickinson was getting mugged. That's just how we play in the Big Ten. We're not. I'm not whining. It is what it is. If the shoe was on the other foot, we'd have been, you know, mugging EJ Liddell. So that's just the rules of the law of the jungle here in the Big Ten Conference. But without Franz Wagner in the game and no Isaiah Livers on the wing, Ohio State really got to collapse on that two-man ball screen game on that final possession. If you've got Isaiah Livers sitting out there on the wing, you can't afford to do that. You have to play that two-man uh, ball screen action. You got to play that puppy straight up or you're going to lose. And just that little bit of margin for error was the difference, I think, in whether you beat a, you know, a top 10 team or not. And I think not having that margin for error, I think that's going to cost Michigan. Uh, the second reason that I don't think you're going to see Michigan get there is I don't like a couple of the matchups in the bracket. I think Florida State and Alabama fit profiles of teams that could give the Wolverines problems. In Alabama's case, we saw with Illinois, the quickness in their backcourt our guards just could not stay in front of theirs, could not keep them away from the 10, could not keep them off the offensive boards. I think when you're dealing with Alabama, you're dealing with a similar Illinois-like quickness in the backcourt. When you look at Florida State, I think uh, they are actually the longest team in America. So if you're looking at uh, kind of what Michigan State did to Hunter Dickinson the second game in East Lansing, Florida State can do that, but with a lot better athletes. Just uh, hammer him over and over again with a lot of long athletes. They play a 10-man rotation there. They're very deep. They won't have to double-team him, so they can play him straight up in the post, wear him down, and extend that defense out onto the perimeter. So I, I just think those matchups, especially, again, without that extra margin for error with Isaiah Livers, I think both of those. Maybe you get a Florida State because we just saw them blow the ACC twice against teams they had no business losing to, the ACC tournament to Georgia Tech, the ACC championship on the road at Notre Dame. So maybe you catch them on one of their mercurial nights, 
But I think asking a team without Isaiah Livers to beat them in Alabama with those matchup problems and potentially in back-to-back games. Now, hey, if there's upsets and the bracket opens up, I've reserved the right to change my mind, but that hasn't happened yet. So I think those are tough matchups for Michigan as it's currently constructed. And then the third reason that I unfortunately don't think we're getting to the Final Four, we already had the, the, the stat for you what happens with coaches on their first trip to the Final Four, but coaches typically don't you know excel their very first year in the NCAA tournament. Keep in mind, he didn't get to coach. Jawan Howard has been phenomenal, and it's only year two. This is only the third time ever Michigan's been a number one seed. He played for one of them, has coached this one. So he's responsible for two of the three. And it's only, let me repeat, only year two. But it's only year two. And from an NCAA tournament perspective, he didn't get a year one. And that it's just a different environment, more to navigate. And I just think when you throw those three things out there, on top of the overall strength of the field just in any given year, I think those are three intangibles that unfortunately are working against the Big Ten champions. Hey, Steve Dace here, and we get asked all the time here at Michigan Podcast, what can we do to help support you guys? Well, one of the things you could do to help support us, which may also support you, is to join our exclusive club at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Michigan Podcast. $5 a month. You get exclusive podcasts, instant reaction ones after Michigan football games. All year long, you get access to our handicapping tips. If you have been following us, for example, this college basketball season, then you're 48 games over 500 documented with all the plays that we have posted all season long here on our Patreon page at Michigan Podcast. Over the weekend, you liked this quite a bit because we posted a parlay, a 14 parlay that paid off at about plus 250 odds. So a good amount of money there. We gave you a couple of conference tournament future bets that paid off as well. Texas paid off as well as uh, Illinois to win the Big Ten at plus 375. So you not only just get you know uh, charged $5 a month, but you may make some good amount of money by supporting us on Patreon as well. So patreon.com slash Michigan podcast is where you can go. Last year, our baseball picks were dynamite. We'll be starting those back up here as we get into April and May. Want to thank all of you for supporting us at Patreon. And if you're not, hey, it might be costing you money by not supporting us at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. This week's Twitter poll results. We asked you how far... Does Michigan go in the NCAA tournament? We have pretty mixed results, so it sounds like a lot of you have trepidation about this as well. 35.7% of you said to the Sweet 16, which you can see, that's how I voted. Uh, 29.6% of you said the Elite Eight. 20.6% of you, the Final Four. 14% of you, the Round of 32. I know there's a lot of fear about a potential second round matchup with LSU. I'm not sure. I'm not so sure LSU gets past St. Bonaventure. And yeah, they have offensive firepower, but they play a lot of ISO on their offense and Michigan's defense is devised to stop stuff like that. But hey, I can see why these results are kind of, we're spraying the board here because I do think it's really tough to project right now without an Isaiah Livers. Let's get to this week's feedback of the week. And it comes from Grumpy SOB. More than happy with this basketball season. Juwan Howard proved a lot. Can't wait to see how things play out after he gets his complete roster in here. What kid wouldn't want to play for him? Amen, brother. Couldn't have said it better myself. Agree with every last word of that. I think you're looking at perennial top tier recruiting classes as well. So, I mean, the future is bright. It's only year two. And here we are sitting as a number one seed and the outright champion of the best league in America. I agree with Grumpy SOB. Could not be happier with the season we just had. Here's hoping, though, I could use a little bit more madness. I won't be mad if I was wrong about the segment I just did on why I don't think we'll make it to Indy. I'd love to be surprised. Here's hoping they shock the world. See what I did there? As they did when Juwan played. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Uh, Don't forget, you can like, rate, follow, subscribe at Michigan Podcast on Twitter, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play here on YouTube, whichever platform you utilize to watch or listen every week. Please make sure you're doing the appropriate things where you're giving us likes, five-star reviews. You're sharing this with everybody you know, all the Michigan fans you know to help us spread the word about what we do each and every week right here on Michigan Podcast. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.